Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Tuesday, August the 25th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me, you preserve me from trouble, you surround me with shouts of deliverance. New Testament reading tonight is from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who made us a competent, who made us competent to be ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry of death carved in the letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze as Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. To this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the image, into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is part 6 of 7 from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 4 on Justification. Scripture affirms this teaching. Editor's note. The Bible teaches that to justify is to declare righteous. In the Gospel of Christ, God declares that we are forgiven, righteous, and holy in his sight. Melanchthon elaborates on this point in Article 4. St. Paul teaches that justification is only by grace through faith, apart from any works of righteousness on man's part, Romans 3.28. Lutherans insist that justification is not a process through which God brings us up to a certain level of holiness, which then qualifies us to receive more grace. 
Rather, it is God's declaration that the dead are alive, the condemned are not guilty, and the sinful are forgiven because of Jesus. In contrast to biblical justification, the Roman Church teaches that God's grace is power infused to begin good works, and that justification is the entire process by which this occurs. This confuses justification, whereby God declares us righteous because of Christ, and sanctification, whereby he begins to conform us to Christ. Such a teaching causes grave doubts in the heart of the believer, who may never be sure whether he is truly justified. The scriptures provide hope, comfort, peace, and joy in knowing that Christ has accomplished all for us through his life, death, and resurrection. The Roman Church's teaching leads to doubt and despair. We are justified through faith. Melanchthon explains at length what the Bible teaches about faith, Christ's perfect obedience to his Father's will, Galatians 4, 4, and 5, and his sacrificial death on the cross, Colossians 1, 22. One forgiveness of sins for the whole world, 1 John 2, 2. How do we personally receive Christ's universal righteousness and atonement? We receive these gifts through faith and faith alone. God gives us faith as a gift through which Christ's righteousness is credited to us, Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, and our sins are forgiven, Romans 3, 22 to 24. Melanchthon carefully states that by no means did the Lutherans consider faith to be mere intellectual assent to historic truths. The devil and ungodly people have this sort of faith. Justifying faith is God-instilled trust that believes the life, death, and resurrection of Christ is for me. It is firm acceptance of God's offer, promising forgiveness of sins and justification. Faith is always personal and individual. No one can have faith for another. Scripture affirms this teaching. Since we receive forgiveness of sins in the Holy Spirit through faith alone, faith alone justifies. For those reconciled are counted as righteous and as God's children. This is not because of their own purity but through mercy for Christ's sake, provided only that they receive this mercy through faith. So scripture testifies that by faith we are accounted righteous. Romans 3.26 We will add testimonies that clearly declare that faith is that very righteousness through which we are accounted righteous before God. This is not because faith is a work that is worthy in itself. It is because faith receives the promise by which God has declared that, for Christ's sake, he wishes to show favor to those believing in him, or because God knows that Christ Jesus was made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption, 1 Corinthians 1.30. In the epistle to the Romans, Paul discusses this topic specifically. He declares that when we believe God for Christ's sake is reconciled to us, we are justified freely through faith. This point, which contains the statement of the entire discussion, Paul sets forth in the third chapter. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Romans 3.28 The adversaries conclude that this passage refers to Levitical ceremonies. But Paul speaks not only of the ceremonies, but of the whole law. For he quotes afterward, 7.7, 7, from the Ten Commandments, You shall not covet. If moral works would merit the forgiveness of sins and justification, there would also be no need for Christ in the promise. All that Paul says about the promise would be overthrown. He would also have been wrong in writing to the Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. 2, 8 through 9. Paul likewise refers to Abraham and David in Romans 4, 1 and 6. But they had God's command for circumcision. Therefore, if any works justified, these works must also have justified at the time they had a command. But Augustine teaches correctly that Paul speaks of the entire law as he discusses at length in his book on the Spirit and the Letter, where he finally says, These matters, having been considered and treated according to the ability that the Lord has thought to, worthy to give us, we conclude that a person is not justified by the precepts of a good life, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Lest we may decide that faith justifies came from Paul without consideration, he fortifies and confirms this teaching by a long discussion in Romans 4. Afterwards, he repeats it in all his letters, so he says in Romans 4, 4 and 5, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. 
Here he clearly says that faith itself is credited for righteousness. Faith is the thing God declares to be righteousness. Paul adds that righteousness is credited freely. He says that it could not be credited freely if it were due because of works. Therefore, he excludes also the merit of moral works. For if justification before God were due to these moral works, faith would not be credited for righteousness without works. Afterward, in Romans 4.9, we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. Romans 5.1 says, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. This means we have consciences that are peaceful and joyful before God. Romans 10.10 10 says, With the heart one believes and is justified. Here he declares that faith is the righteousness of the heart. We also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Galatians 2.16 For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, that no one may boast. Ephesians 2.8-9 but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 1, 12-13 And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. John three fourteen and 15 For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. John 3, 17 and 18. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Acts 13, 38 and 39. How could the office of Christ and justification be declared more clearly? Paul says that the law does not justify, therefore Christ was given that we may believe that for his sake we are justified. He plainly denies justification by the law. So for Christ's sake we are accounted righteous when we believe that God for his sake has been reconciled to us. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4, 11, and 12. Christ's name is received only by faith, therefore we are saved by confidence in Christ's name and not by confidence in our works. For the name here means the cause that is mentioned because of which salvation is gained. To call upon Christ's name is to trust in his name as the cause or price because of which we are saved. Acts fifteen nine says, Cleansed their hearts by faith. Therefore, the faith that the apostles speak about is not useless knowledge, but a reality. It receives the Holy Spirit and justifies us. Habakkuk 2.4 says the righteous shall live by his faith. Here he says, first, that people are just by faith. By faith they believe that God is favorable, and he adds that the same faith gives life because this faith produces peace and joy in the heart and eternal life. Isaiah 53.11 says, By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. What is Christ's knowledge unless it means to know Christ's benefits, the promises that he has scattered throughout the world by the gospel? To know these benefits is properly and truly to believe in Christ, to believe that he will certainly fulfill what God has promised for Christ's sake. Scripture is full of such testimonies. For in some places it presents the law, and in others it presents the promises about Christ, forgiveness of sins, and free acceptance of the sinner for Christ's sake. And tomorrow evening we will conclude Article 4 on Justification with the section called The Church Fathers Affirm This Teaching. Now we join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise your fathomless mercy, with which you take pity on sinful men. All the prophets and apostles preach this to us in your holy word. Let our hope not be put to shame when we pray to you for all who suffer at this time, for behold, the evil foe has become mighty, and the great ones of this world rule often with unrighteousness. O God, who in former times caused your saints to overcome injustice, strengthen also today all who stand in need of your help. Grant that all prisoners of war held as slaves and sacrifices of earthly wrath may return to their home. Stand by all refugees and homeless people and be their justice. Be a father to the widows and orphans with your strong protection. Go through bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness, and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us through their example and the example of so many holy martyrs to be ever watchful of the confession of your son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand on us. But if it is your will that we be persecuted for confessing Jesus as our Lord and only Savior, then support us in your grace that we may withstand all trials and grant us peaceful rest. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, you resist the proud and give grace to the humble. Grant us true humility after the likeness of your only Son, that we may never be arrogant and prideful, and thus provoke your wrath. But in all lowliness be made partakers of the gifts of your grace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.